By the time the Cold War officially ended in 1991, it had left a legacy nearly 50 years in the making. There were veterans of proxy wars who could speak to the damage that an ideological fear of rival political philosophies could bring. There were countries who'd been forced to pick a side right as they were also trying to develop their own independent countries. And the reality was that the roots of the end of this era had begun with movements which emerged in the 1960s and which continue to this day. As you've hopefully already read in your reading packets, there's a move toward nuclear non-proliferation in the late 1960s. Now, the movement started because people were becoming concerned about the safety of the world, given how many more countries had begun to gain nuclear weapons. The Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968 went into effect two years later. The main signatories were the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the USSR. These superpowers, along with 190 other signatories, promised to shift their focus to peaceful uses for nuclear power, such as generating electricity. Well, this didn't mean that the treaty countries would give up their weapons entirely. So far, only South Africa has completely denuclearized. But rather, that countries would promise not to build more and slowly begin to decrease their nuclear arsenals. Later treaties would also ensure that countries wouldn't test their nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, in outer space, or underwater. Nevertheless, an alarming number of countries developed nuclear weaponry in the second half of the 20th century. Well, this video clip you're about to watch illustrates every nuclear detonation from the first successful one in the United States in 1945 through detonations in 1998.
As you can probably deduce from the clip, there were some interesting non-signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Notably, Israel, India, and Pakistan did not sign the treaty. In a more modern context, it is now known that North Korea possesses a nuclear arsenal, and some governments fear that Iran does as well. So it was clear that this movement, one spurred by citizens, not governments, had begun to lessen the enormous tension of the arms race. Next, it was time to address the fact that the Soviet Union system just wasn't working. The United States had seemed to learn its lesson with regards to proxy wars after leaving Vietnam in 1975, but the USSR had not. In 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, ostensibly to help communist groups overthrow a corrupt government. Very quickly, however, the Soviet army was mired in a situation about which they knew little. As had been true in Vietnam, the Afghan people were in reality fighting a battle about which the Soviets knew little, and it wasn't really about communism. The Soviets would be in Afghanistan for 10 years, for roughly as long as sustained numbers of American troops had been in Vietnam, and this war would drain precious resources from the Soviet government. Mikhail Gorbachev had become the premier of the Soviet Union in 1985, and as a reformer, he put in place two policies, Glasnost and Perestroika, aimed at lessening the repressiveness of the Soviet system. But two years later, when American President Ronald Reagan was in Berlin to commemorate the 750th anniversary of that city, Reagan gave a speech which explicitly referenced Gorbachev's policies as he urged Gorbachev to bring down the Berlin Wall. And now, now the Soviets themselves may in a limited way be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. Certain foreign news broadcasts are no longer being jammed. Some economic enterprises have been permitted to operate with greater freedom from state control. Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state, or are they token gestures intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it? We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign that the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, Come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Twenty-nine months later, on November 9th of 1989, East Germany opened that Berlin Wall. This opening eventually led to the destruction of the wall, and it would signal the beginning of the end of the Cold War. On March 18th of 1990, East Germans would vote for reunification with West Germany.
While Gorbachev's policy of glasnost was good for the Soviet Union, his policy of perestroika was beginning to cause economic problems. Consumer goods, food, and clothing were increasingly scarce, and the governments of the Soviet Socialist Republics, the SSRs, were scrambling to deal with protests from their people. Throughout 1990, there were constant revolts throughout the Soviet bloc, mostly because the Soviet Socialist Republics, which made up the Soviet Union, wanted a greater say in that union's government. A new treaty was drafted by Gorbachev seeking to establish a new union which would create a truly voluntary federation, since most of the SSRs had been forced into joining the USSR in the 1920s. But Gorbachev's moves were simply too little too late. In June of 1991, Boris Yeltsin would be elected Russian president. He spoke out against the Soviet Union, declaring that Russia should separate from the USSR and establish its own federation. The Soviet Union collapsed with dramatic speed during the latter part of 1991 as one SSR after another declared independence. On a nationally televised speech on December 25th of 1991, Gorbachev formally resigned his position as president of the USSR, declared the position extinct, and handed over the Soviet nuclear codes to President Yeltsin. The Soviet Union was formally dissolved the following day. While Gorbachev was considered a traitor to the Soviet cause by hardliners, over time, Gorbachev instead came to be seen as a hero. He even won the Nobel Peace Prize. That legacy is perfectly demonstrated in this commercial for Pizza Hut. Это Горбачев. Горбачев. Это из-за него у нас в экономике бардак. Да благодаря ему у нас новые возможности. Это из-за него у нас политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря ему у нас свобода. Полный хаос. Перспективы. Политическая нестабильность. Да благодаря ему у нас есть писахат. За Горбачева! За Горбачева! За Горбачева! Sometimes nothing brings people together like a nice hot pizza from Pizza Hut. За So, looking back, it was clear that throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the USSR was losing influence. The non-aligned movement, in which often decolonizing countries agreed not to align with either superpower during the Cold War, had morphed by the 1980s to indicate that number of countries, today numbering 120, which agree not to align with any global power bloc, not just Cold War-associated blocs. As it became clear that the Soviet Union's version of communism was increasingly unable to adjust to new economic realities, decolonizing countries were less likely to adopt any form of communism for their government. Instead, as you've already learned, countries that struggled to establish working governments, often, unfortunately, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, tended to become military dictatorships, adopting authoritarian governments. Other countries had more successful decolonization stories, but often ethnic or religious tensions continued to plague the country. In India, for example, after independence, not only did the governments of India and Pakistan have to deal with tensions within their borders, but they dealt with continuing tensions between their two countries as well. In India, Nehru became prime minister in 1947, a position he would hold until 1964. While Nehru championed secularism and democracy, religious tensions nonetheless erupted. In 1984, India's then prime minister, Indira Gandhi, who was Nehru's daughter, was assassinated by two of her Sikh bodyguards in apparent retaliation of her government's attack on a group of Sikh extremists. In 1986, a group of Sikh extremists took over the Golden Temple, one of the Sikh's holiest sites. This takeover underscored the religious tensions which remained in Punjab, India's wealthiest state. But Pakistan fared a bit worse. Muhammad Ali Jinnah died in 1948 and was thus unable to continue directing the formation of a Pakistani government. Sadly, Pakistan was roiled by military dictatorships 
And despite attempts to hold elections, military leaders often effected coups which upended any sort of peaceful government change. In fact, Pakistan did not have a peaceful transition of power until 2013. Additionally, Pakistan faced civil war. East Pakistan, which was on the other side of India, declared independence in 1971 and became the country of Bangladesh. At the same time, India and Pakistan continued to fight over territories, often Kashmir. These tensions continue to this day, and Pakistan has additionally been dragged into the war on terror, given its proximity to Afghanistan and the fact that Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are active in the mountainous areas of Pakistan. While the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the other great communist state, China, also faced a kind of disintegration, but it was not nearly as absolute as that of the Soviet Union, which, after all, ceased to exist entirely. Or rather than watch itself crumble, the Chinese state sought to manage their transition from a fully command economy to more of a free market one. This shift has been somewhat successful. China's economy grew enormously, and it has carved out a place for itself in manufacturing. Now today, when Western economists refer to outsourcing in tech manufacturing, they're often referring to China. That said, China's economic growth has not necessarily meant an adoption of Western-style democratic values. In 1989, Chinese people began demonstrating against the government. Now some of these demonstrations were about economic anxiety. While the economic reforms benefited some Chinese people, the vast majority of them feared being left behind. In May of 89, just days before Mikhail Gorbachev visited China for a highly publicized state visit, Chinese students began a hunger strike in the hopes of achieving Western-style political change. Instead, the government responded to these demonstrations with military force. The Tiananmen Square Massacre, or the June 4th Movement as it's known in China, this movement was an attempt to bring about democratic reform in China. It was often led by students, who had a stake in what the future of China might look like. Unfortunately, their voices were silenced. According to the Chinese government, nearly 300 people died, mostly civilians, as a result of the repression. The US government estimates that nearly 10,000 people may have actually been killed. But China did not institute any kind of reforms that the protesters wanted, although some of the officials who organized the military repression were removed from power and even jailed. The Chinese government rolled back some of the freedoms that they had allowed in the early 1980s. Well, even today, the Chinese government continues to struggle between Western-style democracy and capitalism and traditional communism. Just how much freedom should the Chinese government give the Chinese people and still retain control? At the turn of the 21st century, there were still four countries with communist governments, China, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. While most of the world considers North Korea to be a communist country, the North Korean constitution was changed in 2009 to remove any mention of Marxism or communism. Instead, the North Korean government refers to its guiding political philosophy as Juche, the concept of self-reliance. But in ideas and in practice, this philosophy parallels 20th century communism. But there are many more countries in the world with active communist parties, some of which have at times become the governing party of that country. Most recently, Nepal, Guyana, and Moldova have all been governed by their communist parties. One of the legacies of the Cold War has been the distrust with which some Western states still view anything which is considered remotely close to communism. Well, that's an interesting situation because there are quite a few countries governed by socialist governments. Portugal, India, Tanzania come to mind. While socialism and communism share a common economic philosophy, equality among society's members, a socialism holds that a person's individual wealth should depend on their productivity in that economy, while in communism, the government is supposed to redistribute wealth based on the basic needs of each individual. Well, the reason for this difference in its economic outlook is that communism is also a political philosophy which seeks a classless society and which is explicitly atheist. They believe it's the responsibility of this government to redistribute the wealth. It is perhaps for this reason that there are so few expressly communist governments remaining in the world. Even more countries have at times been ruled by their democratic socialist parties. 
A democratic socialism seeks to achieve socialist economic goals through democratic means, mainly through legislation. Unlike socialists, democratic socialists believe that the ideas promoted by Marxism and Leninism are undemocratic in practice, and for this reason, they tend to reject those philosophies as well as Soviet-style communism. Many European countries have legislation that is considered a hallmark of democratic socialism. Nationalized health care, for instance, free or almost free university education, and the list goes on. In the 21st century, perhaps the biggest question which remains with regards to contemporary states and communism is this one. Does a successful free market economic system rely on a democratic political system? Well, China's economic success seems to indicate no. The success of other more authoritarian governments, such as that in Malaysia, also seem to indicate no. And yet, if we look at economic innovation, then it is the countries with both capitalist economies and democratic systems which are more successful. So the question remains, are capitalism and democracy irrevocably intertwined? Or will some other kind of political philosophy come to rule the rest of the 21st century?